All right, so today I'm excited because we're starting a brand new series. It's called In the Fire. If you look on the screen, got a nice little graphic there. Uh, and what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, however long this takes, we're going to be looking at different stories within the life of Daniel. And all the different times that he got caught up in some type of fire. One time literally, other times metaphorically. Uh, whenever I think of Daniel in In the Fire, my mind rushes to the story of Daniel being thrown into the blazing, blazing furnace. In the story, you have Daniel, uh, who's been exiled to Babylon, and you have King Nebuchadnezzar. He's an absolute tyrant of a king. And he gets, I guess he's so narcissistic that he wants everybody to bow down to a statue of himself. So he made this giant golden statue, and he has everybody bow down, and of course Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not bow down. They're thrown into a blazing furnace because of it. So hot that even the people who throw him in end up getting burnt to death. But while they're in there, well, I guess Josh will have to, he'll have to tell you because I don't want to spoil it. But uh, yeah, so it's a great story, blazing furnace. I also think a story where you have Daniel in the lion's den. Another great story. At this point, King Darius, another tyrant. King Darius basically makes a law to where he wants nobody to pray to anybody but him. Doesn't want anybody to pray to their own God. Of course, Daniel doesn't listen to King Darius because he's a rebel. <laughs> and he prays to his own God, and he's thrown directly into a lion's den because of it. These are two times when Daniel found himself in some type of fire, again, whether literal or metaphorical. But as hot as that fire was, and as sharp as those lion's teeth were, Daniel faced a challenge that was much tougher than lions or a furnace. You see, around 600 BC, when Daniel was about 14 or 15, uh, anybody, Robbie, how old are you? 12, Trent, how old are you, man? 14, so think of somebody like Trent's age. When Daniel was about 14 or 15, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed Judah, and he exiled all of its citizens to Babylon. Now, Paul, let's pause here. Let's do some history homework. Babylon rose to power by defeating the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a terrible, brutal, savage people. When they raided a town or village, they would kill all the men, do horrible things to the women. They would take children as slaves. That's who the, this is who the Assyrians were. They were known for taking captives, and they would pierce their nose right here. You might know, what's that piercing right here called? I don't even know what it's called. Some girls get it. I don't know. They would pierce people through their nose and then run a hook through all the people's noses with a string, and they would drag these people back to where they came from, back to Assyria. That's who the Assyrians were. Another example of their brutality is they would actually skin people alive and then use their skin as wallpaper. That's, this, is the, this, is, this is who the Assyrians were. It's graphic. But that's who they were. Now, the Babylonians grew to power by defeating the Assyrians. You don't, you don't beat the Assyrians by being weak. You don't beat the Assyrians by being nice. The Babylonians were a brutal people in their own right, but when it came to exiles, they dealt with their exiles differently. Here's what the people of Judah would have likely experienced when they were exiled to Babylon. Babylon would have come and destroyed Judah and rounded up the people. They would have led them 900 miles back to Babylon, where they would see this massive city, this massive country of Babylon. It was a massive place surrounded by walls that were 300 feet high, 80 feet thick. It was an impenetrable fortress. It was these, these walls were dug 30 feet into the ground. If you want to wanted to attack Babylon, you had to dig 30 feet just to get inside the city. The Euphrates River ran all the way around it. Fun fact about this, blows my mind. The, Babylon, Bab the Babylonians rerouted the entire Euphrates River to go around their country. I don't know how you do that in ancient times. I guess it's a lot of digging, probably. <laughs> but they re somehow rerouted the entire Euphrates River to go around the, the, to go around Babylon. They created a natural moat. If you wanted to attack Babylon, not only did you have to dig 30 feet down, you also had to cross the Euphrates River. They were able to reroute part of it to go through the country as like a natural irrigant, a natural source of irrigation. Babylon was about three times the size of Washington, D.C., and just as corrupt. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and so the, you would have, they would have taken these, these captives as exiles, and they would have entered into this massive city. They would have crossed a drawbridge, and they would have, been, they would have, they would have seen this beautiful city. I don't know if you know much about Babylon, but it was, it was a gorgeous place. It was a place that represented power and wealth and status and opportunity and beauty. They invented this thing called the ziggurat. Anybody know what a ziggurat is? It's kind of like a pyramid, but not quite. It's like this platform with another big platform on it with another. It's kind of like a pyramid, and they used to like plant gardens on them. They used them as temples, all kinds of stuff. They had uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar even created one of the seven wonders of the world, which is the hanging gardens. He created them for his wife. It's again like this massive ziggurat with these gardens on top of it, and somehow they were able to get water up there to flow. It's like a natural waterfall, all kinds of stuff. That's who the Babylonians were. So the Babylonians would have brought the Israelite exiles to Babylon. They would have told them, basically, the city's yours. Settle down. Get a job and raise your family. Enjoy it. This is your city. All we ask, listen to this, all we ask is that you conform. All we ask is that you conform to our society. So people would conform. They would conform to the Babylonian customs, the Babylonian way of life, the Babylonian culture, even the Babylonian religious ways. Daniel faced a blazing furnace in a lion's den. But those were only repercussions for standing up against the culture and religious ways of Babylon. The toughest battle that Daniel ever faced had nothing to do with lions or a furnace. The toughest battle that Daniel had to face was within himself. Seeing the beauty of Babylon, feeling the pressure to conform, and yet not conforming out of love and devotion to his God. That was the toughest battle that he ever faced. Don't get me wrong, the furnace and lions were tough, but those were repercussions for standing up against Babylon, for standing up against the culture. So we looked at a grand scale of, of Babylon and the pressure that they placed on society upon exiles to conform. Now let's look at Daniel specifically. Let's, let's take a, a deep dive into Daniel and his life and the, the pressure that he would have faced to conform himself. It says Daniel chapter 1. Uh, verse 1, if you'd like to open up, that's where we're going to be today, Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look through the whole chapter. It won't go too fast, or it won't, it won't take too long. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon to the house of his gods and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. Okay, so like we already talked about, Babylon came and destroyed Judah, took the people as exiles. While he was taking the people as exiles, he also took some things from the temple and he brought them back to Babylon. Verse 3, the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect. Listen to this. Listen to the description of these guys. Young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving, serving in the king's palace. These guys were the real deal. In other words, he's like, hey, go find those guys. Go find the best guys that Israel has to offer. They're going to come work for me now. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. It sounds pretty nice. The king's food? Dude. Nice. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to attend the king. Among them, from the Judahites, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Now, what Daniel was facing here is nothing short of indoctrination. And I know the word indoctrination is far too used. It's overused today. It seems like everybody's <laughs> indoctrinating somebody. But what's happening here is he's being indoctrinated. Think about it. He's, he's given a new name and identity. He's given a new name. You're no longer Daniel anymore. You're Belteshazzar. Probably has some meaning. 
They offered him the best food and wine. We're going to wine and dine. You're going to get everything you possibly want. We're going to take care of you. You're going to get the good stuff. You're going to get the king's food, the king's wine. It's the real deal. They taught them everything that they wanted these people to know. Most people, most people could not stand up against that pressure. You got the societal pressure from Babylon raining down on you. You have to conform to us or else. Then you got the indoctrination that Daniel faced. It's amazing that he ever resisted. That's amazing. Most people couldn't stand up against that. Most people would have ended up taking the bait. How do I know? Look at college students. Look at college students. Look at college students and the pressure that they face when they leave their homes and they're confronted with a culture that says conform. You must conform. I've seen it countless times. A family will raise their children and those kids will be taught the Christian way. They'll be brought to church. They'll be involved in the youth group, etc. And those kids, those same kids go off to college where mommy and daddy aren't holding your hand anymore. Those same kids go off to college where mom and dad aren't taking them to church every week, and these college students have a battle to fight within them. It is a battle, a spiritual battle raging with inside them. This is a spiritual battle where one side says, stick with God and the way that you've been taught, stick with, you know, stick with all that stuff, and the other side says, you're now your own God. You can do whatever you want. All you have to do is leave that old way behind. Looking at statistics, we can see that most college students leave the church and leave their faith behind. They might come back someday when they have their own kids, but most of them never do. Parents, this first point is for you. You need to build a faith foundation within your kids. You need to build a faith foundation within your kids because someday they will leave Judah home, the metaphorical Judah. They'll, they'll leave home where they've been taught the Christian way. They've been taken to church, all that stuff. They're going to leave the metaphorical Judah. They're going to be exiled into the Babylonian world. America is very much a Babylon. It's maybe not as brutal, but in very many ways it is a Babylon. And there will be a spiritual battle that rages inside your kids. They need to be prepared, and it starts with you. I say this with all the love in my heart every ounce of love that I can muster. Do not. Do not bring me your kids someday and say, well, you're the youth minister. Make Christians out of my kids. It's not my job. It's not my job. Don't get me wrong. I will always do my absolute best to teach your kids about the Bible. I'll always do my best to build within your children a firm faith foundation. It's what I love to do. It's why I'm here. But statistics and the, the evidence that I've seen with my own side, my own eyes, uh, show that kids who have the strongest faith are the kids whose parents are actively involved in the faith walk of their children. The kids who have the strongest faith are the kids whose parents are involved. I, as a youth minister, really ideally should only be a supplement to the nutrition that you provide your kids at home, the spiritual nutrition you provide them at home. Caleb, you're a, you're a health guy. If I went to GNC and got a bunch of supplements and only ate supplements for like, let's say a month, would I be healthy? Why? Because you need nutrition, right? So why do we so often take our kids to church and say, here's the supplement. We're just going to hope for the best. I think you'll be all right. We need to be providing our kids with a spiritual foundation, a faith foundation. This is so important. It starts with you, parents. It starts with us. And I don't say this from a place of like, you need to get on my level. You guys need to do what I'm doing. I say this from the position of like, we all need to do this together. We all need to be like Christ together and uplift each other and our kids towards Christ together. We're a team. All right, let's move on. Daniel, first, I'm sorry, Dan, not first Daniel. Daniel 1, verses 8 through 16. It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. There are questions as to why this food might defile Daniel. Uh, the, the, main, uh, line, the, main, the main lines of thought 
are one, it was probably either unclean food prohibited by Jewish law, or maybe this food was uh, sacrificed to false gods. It didn't really say why, but that's the idea. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank, so he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch, yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. So he gives them kind of like a little test. Give us vegetables and water. After ten days, we're going to see where we're at. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, Daniel and his three friends weren't the only Jewish boys who were being trained to serve the king. They weren't the only ones. There were more. Don't believe me? Look at verse 19. The king interviewed them. And among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There were more people who were being trained to serve the king. The rest of the Jewish boys being trained seemed to have caved under the pressure to eat the king's food. I find it likely that while the Babylonians and perhaps the other Jewish boys being trained would have looked at Daniel and his three friends and thought, why are you, being, why, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Why are you being so uptight? Just eat the food, dude. You're in the king's palace, man. This place is awesome. Just, just relax. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? Ashpenaz certainly did. His comment to Daniel was essentially, look, listen, like getting you guys vegetables and water isn't worth me dying over. So they all seemed to look at Daniel and his friends in the, with the attitude of, stop making a mountain out of a molehill. And when I read this portion of text, I can't help but to be reminded of some of the pressure that we face today in our modern society. There are certain things that Christians, we simply don't do. And yet the world looks at us and goes, why are you making such a big deal out of this? It's not that serious. Some examples, it's, it's just sex, dude. It's not even that serious. You're gonna gonna buy a car without test driving at first. It's not. It's not. Just relax, dude. It's just porn. The people on the screen consent. They even get paid for this. It hurts nobody. Relax. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? We probably shouldn't gossip. Probably shouldn't gossip about this, but it's really important, and we'll make sure to keep it between us, right? If it just stays between us, it's not a big deal. Nobody will know. It's all good. <laughs> It's just one little white lie, right? Nobody will ever, ever find out. So you don't need to worry about it. There are things that we as Christians do not do that the world says, listen, it's not that serious, bro, relax. And what's sad is that, like the other Jewish boys being trained to serve the king, there are other Christians who fall into the same trap as the world saying, man, it's not that serious. Why are we being so uptight about this? But you have to realize that Daniel had a different perspective. Anybody know what Daniel's name meant? What does Daniel's name meant? Anybody mean? Anybody know? Daniel's name means God is my judge. That's what Daniel's name means. God is my judge. Daniel didn't care what the other Jewish trainees thought. Daniel didn't care what the Babylonians thought. Dan Daniel didn't care what the Babylonians would do. Why? Because none of them would ever sit on the throne of judgment. Why do we spend so much time trying to please those outside the church and those inside the church when those same exact people will have to stand before the same judge on judgment day as everybody else? It's not our job to determine what's a big deal and what's not a big deal. It's our job to determine what God commands of us, commands of us and then we obey those commands. Whether the world thinks it's a big deal or not, whether our fellow Christians think it's a big deal or not, we trust and obey. We trust that God's ways are sufficient, because they are. We obey commands. We obey God's commands. One out of fear. Yes, I said fear. A lot of times we don't like to talk about fearing God. 
But look at Proverbs 1, 7. Fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. I'm not saying you have to cower in front of him like, ah, oh, don't hurt me, but like there's a respect there. This is God we're talking to. We obey God's command out of fear and out of love because of the love that he has for us. I think of the life that I've been given. I'm the most blessed man on the face of the earth. I've given, given a family who's absolutely beautiful. I've got a job that I love. And even more than all that, I've been given forgiveness by our, our Creator through the, the sacrifice that His Son made on the cross. That's amazing. It's amazing. So we trust and we obey God's command out of love and out of fear. Let's continue on. Daniel 1, 17 through 21. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time that, king, that, that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. Fun fact about Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. I didn't get to it. Nebuchadnezzar, the name literally means Nabu, protect my heir. Nabu, protect my heir. Nabu was a false god. Uh, Nabu was a god of uh, wisdom and literature. Fun fact. Okay, so whenever you see Nebuchadnezzar, Nabu, protect my heir. At the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king. In every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and mediums in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. I find it hard to not view Daniel's refusal to eat the king's food as a test. It very much feels like a test. Let me put it this way. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30 is the parable of the talents. In this parable, a man goes on a journey and he entrusts his servants with his property. He gave one of his servants five talents, the other two talents, and lastly, he gives his final servant one talent. His first servant goes off and doubles his master's talents from five to ten. His second servant goes off and doubles his master's talents from two to four. His last servant, anybody remember what happens there? Buries it buries his master's talents, and is ultimately condemned because of it. It even says that he gets sent off, was weeping and gnashing of teeth, all that stuff. But I want to look at what this master says to his two servants who doubled their talents. He says to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. Listen to this. You've been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. You've been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge over many things. Now share the joy of your master. Daniel refuses to eat of the king's food and is then given knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom, the ability to understand visions, the ability to understand dreams, and he's found to be superior to all the other people who were training to serve the king. Now we could ask whether or not these gifts were bestowed upon Daniel from God as a gift in return to their faithfulness, or if these or if these things happened in Daniel as a natural result of their faithfulness, or both. But one thing seems to be true either way. When we're faithful with little, we'll be given much more. This isn't always necessarily a good thing, by the way. Or perhaps a better way to say it is, yes, you'll be given more, but with that also comes in a very heavy responsibility. An example of this is James 3, verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Another example is Luke 12, verses 42 through 48. Let's go there for a second. Lord, Peter asks, are you telling this parable to, our, to us or to everyone? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager? His master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will put them, he will put them in charge of all of his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, 
my master is delaying his coming and starts to beat the male and female servants and to eat the and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him, and in an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it will be severely beaten. But the one who does not, who did not know and did what deserved punishment will receive a light beating. Listen to this part. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. We need to begin focusing on obedience and faithfulness in the small areas of life before we get carried away with what might come next. I think it's interesting that this, the first challenge that Dan Daniel had to face was simply not eating the king's food. It's such a simple thing. And even from my perspective, it does feel like, why are you making such a big deal out of this, man? Just eat the food. But obedience in the small things is important. For example, let's say, let's say you're, you're a young man who wants a wife and kids someday. What you need to focus on now isn't someday getting a wife and kids, but instead how to treat a woman in a way that glorifies God, which can largely be learned through how to, how to love your mother. Fun fact. Example number two, if you want to want to be a CEO of a company someday, what you need to focus on isn't someday being the CEO of a company, but instead waking up early, getting to work on time, and putting in an honest, hard day's work. Sometimes we need to accomplish the small things before we're given something bigger. Example three, if you want to someday reap the benefits of a life with God, the peace that he brings, the order that he can bring to life, you don't need to focus on necessarily the benefits you might someday experience, but instead you need to focus on obedience in the small, seemingly mundane things what it means to be in continuous prayer, building up your knowledge of Scripture. Sometimes we want to reap the benefits without putting in the work, but that's just not how it typically works. Daniel was obedient in the smallest of things, and it led to greater responsibility, greater work to be, got, to be done, greater fulfillment. So my question to you, is are you ready to be obedient in the small things? I know for myself, I sometimes look at the small things like, ah, it's not that serious, not a big deal. Like, we just, it's, it's just a small thing. But those small things matter. Those small things add up. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to all come and just be together, learn more about you, learn about Daniel. We ask that you um, let this message sit on our hearts and change us into people who are more like you. Uh, we're thankful for each other, thankful for this church and the opportunity to be a part of a church, a part of the, a group of people who love each other and love you even more. Um, we ask that you help us to never take you for granted, but to keep you center of everything that we do. We love you, Father. And so in your sons, let me pray. Amen.